Hey everybody, welcome back. We have our next screencast lecture starting right now. Let's get rolling because I got a lot to do and not a lot of time to do it. So biotic potential is our topic. What is biotic potential? So here's our first major vocabulary word, biotic potential. Before I give you the exact definition of biotic potential, I want you to think about the word itself. See if you can figure out what it might mean. I know you guys have been doing a lot of word within the word, so if you take a look at the prefix bio, let's break it into parts. The first is the prefix bio. What does that prefix bio mean? Hey, uh, what does the prefix bio mean, guys? Life. Life, that's correct. So the prefix bio means life. And the next part is potential. And so what does the word potential mean? Now, you may have heard your parents say something like this, like, hey, uh, you should be doing much better in school. You have the potential to get higher grades. Uh, you have the potential to get higher grades. Another thing could be like this, for example. the uh, If you take a, an elastic rubber band and you stretch it, it has now increased its elastic potential energy because if you take it and you shoot it, it will uh, release that elastic potential energy and can fly across the room. So potential means the ability to become something in the future. Like you have the potential to become a doctor or, the, or a lawyer or whatever. So biotic potential is going to be something like the amount of life that could happen. So imagine an ecosystem where resources are shared according to need among members of a species. So if there's 100 rabbits, those 100 rabbits only use the resources that they need. They, there's none wasted. None of them uh, are missing any resources that they need. It's a perfect ideal situation. So now we're finally to the sciency definition of biotic potential. This is going to be the highest rate of reproduction under ideal conditions. So there's going to be enough resources for all members of that species. What would that highest rate of reproduction be? A great example is if there is a mother alligator and she lays six alligator eggs. So in an ideal situation, all six of those eggs will hatch all six of those baby alligators will live. They will survive long enough to become adults. So how many new alligators are we going to have if all six of them hatch? Well, probably be able to figure that out, that six alligators will survive to become adult alligators. So that would be the biotic potential in this situation. So six alligator eggs will grow up to become six alligators. Now, does that happen in real life? No, no, it doesn't always happen in real life. This is a hypothetical situation in which all of the offspring can survive until adulthood. In real life, not all of them are going to survive. Something's going to happen. A predator is going to eat one. Maybe one will uh, die of disease. Maybe one will be uh, malnourished or uh, there's some sort of genetic defect and it's not going to survive. You, uh, and another idea of, in terms of biotic potential is that the number of offspring has a a great effect on this. The larger number of offspring that are produced by parent organisms, the higher the biotic potential of the species. Take a look here. We have a peach and we have a strawberry. So if we're going to compare the biotic potential of the peach versus the strawberry, which would have the higher biotic potential? Well, think about it. Just like these six alligator eggs can grow up to be six alligators, um, each seed we're going to imagine will be in an ideal situation and will grow up to be an adult. So you just have to figure out how many seeds each of these fruits has. Well, the peach has only one. It has only one pit versus the strawberry has more than that. I'm not going to sit around and count them all. The strawberry has a much greater biotic potential than the peach, therefore. The strawberry has dozens of seeds per fruit. The peach has only one seed per fruit. It's called a pit. If each seed produces a new plant, there would be many more strawberry pant, plant pants. Strawberry pants. There'll be many more strawberry plants compared to one peach tree. Is there an advantage to having something like the strawberry with many, many, many seeds? There can be. There can be some advantages to that. 
since there are so many seeds, the chances of one of those seeds growing into adult increases versus having only one seed having a chance. If that one seed from the peach fruit dies, doesn't make it, well, then there's zero chance from that fruit producing a new plant versus the strawberry. If one of them dies, it's not a real big deal at all because there's still another hundred strawberry seeds from that fruit that could grow into strawberry plants. It increases the chances that at least one of them is going to survive to form a new plant. And every time there's advantages to things, you're usually going to find some disadvantages. Are there disadvantages to having a large number of seeds like the strawberry? Yes, there are some disadvantages. One is that it does take energy and it does take nutrients to produce large number of seeds. These seeds don't come from nowhere. You need to uh, have the, the, the parent strawberry plant collect nutrients. Uh, it takes time. It takes energy to make a whole bunch of different seeds. And then also, if all of these seeds do successfully grow into strawberry plants, there's going to be a huge amount of competition. So the new seedlings are going to be competing directly with one another. And as we saw in a previous lecture, often the most fierce competition is going to be amongst members of the same species. Why? Well, because they are competing for the exact same resources that they need. Let's take a look at a video clip. All species, like our own human population, have the biotic potential to establish an ever-accelerating or exponential rate of population growth. However, studies of ecosystems undisturbed by human beings show that most populations don't continue to grow larger and larger over time, but rather tend to remain relatively stable. The reason most populations don't continue to grow exponentially is that they reach the environment's carrying capacity or encounter environmental resistance in the form of severe weather, predators, parasites, or competitors. Living populations are also distributed throughout the environment in different patterns. Some organisms live in large clusters or aggregations. For example, most herbivores live in herds, many birds live in flocks, and large numbers of fish live in schools. Other organisms, such as fir trees in boreal forests and creosote bushes in the desert, tend to be uniformly distributed in their environment, while throughout most of the year, monarch butterflies and brown bears are randomly scattered in theirs. Populations also exhibit characteristic distribution patterns over time as well. For example, in some species populations, the majority of individuals live to old age, while in others, most individuals die very young, and only a relative few survive into old age. In between these two extremes are populations in which individuals' chances of death are relatively constant throughout their life. Let's now take a closer look at the factors that affect the growth of populations and their distribution across space and over time. All right, well, that's it. So, like I told you, we weren't going to take too long doing this one. This was biotic potential. Catch us next time. We're going to discuss changes in population sizes. See ya. Careful, kids. Bye. Careful, kids. Bye. Careful, kids. Bye. Careful.